after last week. I want to read uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want to begin at verse 13. And Paul is writing now back to this church that he loves so dearly, and you're going to hear that in his uh, word, uh, words to the church in his writing, his great love he had for these dear people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe all the believers said yes Yes. for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and they are contrary or against all men. They are forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brothers, having been taken away from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, we endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire, Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope? What is our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Can you say amen to that passage? So from that, I want to extract this truth. How true believers grow through suffering. How true believers grow through suffering. Lord Jesus, thank you for protecting and preserving your holy word, God, for us today. We read from it, Lord, even though it was written some 2,000 years ago, and it is as fresh and relevant today as it was even then because it is eternally your word. So now help us, Lord, to absorb it. We open our hearts to you, God. We discipline our minds, Lord, to hear the truth of your word today. I pray that you would transform us with this truth to become more like you, Jesus. I pray, God, that you would heal the sick, set the captive free, and save the lost today after this message, during this message, Lord. And I pray this blessing for everybody that hears this word in Jesus' name. Would you agree with that and say amen? Let's clap our hands one more time before we're seated. Thank you, Lord, for this great word you've given us. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. All healthy churches experience growing pains as they seek to make disciples and glorify God. All true believers grow through moments of breaking experienced in suffering. If you are a true believer, if you have cultivated the soil of your soul so the word of the Lord goes deep in and takes root and you guard it and you don't let the enemy come and take that word out of your heart and you work through the rocks in your soul and your personality so that that word can go deep, that's a true believer. All true believers grow through what I call moments of breaking. Those moments of breaking are experienced in suffering. This is a time in every Christian's life when God does his most profound work of healing. It demolishes our false self. It strips the facade of our life naked before God. And it removes our crutches. These moments of breaking in suffering are giant steps of self-discovery in spiritual growth. This is opposite of what our flesh wants because none of us want to suffer. 
We, we want to take the easy road of less resistance and we'll go around our pain, we'll go around our suffering, but you got to understand the way that God created us. He said that you will grow through your suffering when you have these moments of breaking and you think, oh, my life is going to end. Well, that is partially true because if you're living in darkness, we're praying that you're, that, that life that you're living in the flesh will end today. Because all of us know when we come through these moments of breaking of so much pain and our suffering, we come out on the other side and we're a different person. And we realize that pain in the human experience, suffering, persecution, like these precious saints in Thessalonia were going through, pain tells us that we're alive. Pain is an indicator that something is wrong in your body, in your soul, or in your spirit. All right? So pain always helps us if we, if we respond to it right. If, if, you, if, if you break your bone, there's a lot of pain. Why? Because your nature, God, the way he made you, is saying, you know what? That, has to, that bone has to be reset. If you have a bug in your body and you're sick and you're, uh, some, something's wrong here, I'm in so much pain, I just, I feel, okay, well, that's, you, you need to, the first thing you need to do is rest. And so all of these, when pain comes to us, the older you get, you, you discover more pains. And, and well, what is that? Well, yeah, but I can't change that in the aging. No, you can't change it. You live with your mortality, understanding every day you're getting older. But that pain helps us to know that, hey, my time may be a little more limited now. I don't have as many days or years. All you old people keep looking young at me right now. I, I, so that pain lets me know that, hey, 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 I better be living my life on purpose. So none of us should go into eternity without living out all the chapters that God has written for the book of your life. Don't leave early. And the way we get through the chapters is these moments of breaking. First Thessalonians, or excuse me, first Second Timothy, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All, that includes you and I. If we're going to live godly, that's the definition of a true believer. We're going to suffer persecution. Suffer, persecute. In this second chapter of Paul's writing, he explains the heavenly resources that true believers have in times of suffering and persecution. He gives us some resources that I want to bring to you today. The first is found in verse 13, and the first resource that God gives us to help us break through into a greater blessing and dimension of his power is God's word within us. God's word. He said, therefore, 13, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Okay, that's why there is right now a, a price tag on every true believing pastor, prophet, evangelist, teacher, missionary, apostle. That's why we, we, we're, 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 we are reading reports of unprecedented failures in great preachers, mega pastors, that pastor and oversee thousands of people in one local church, many campuses. And we're seeing some of them that had great anointing, that greatly used it, helped tens, hundreds of thousands of people. And just in, in three or four months, we've watched in Dallas, Texas, which is a buckle of the Bible belt, three of those prominent pastors fall. Why is that? Well, you can always blame it on their flesh, and yes, yes, yes. But you got to understand something. Okay, look at the story behind the story. Look at the kingdom of God, what's happening here. Do you think the devil understands that if he can get a preacher to fall, then that discredits all preachers? 
And if people in churches stop believing that they're anointed preachers, true preachers are preaching God's word, they'll start thinking, oh, that's just your words. That's just your words. And Paul said, the reason why your church grew, the reason why you broke through these breaking points is because you took my word that I taught you as the holy word of God, which was exactly what it was. Are you awake today? So the devil's trying to discredit the spoken word of God from pastors and teachers. That's why you should know them that labor among you. That's why you ought to come to a church and say, I know that man, I see him. He's not here just once a month or once a year. No, 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 I know this guy. I hear him. I feel his spirit. I watch his life. That's, that's really, that, that, that can be a very scary thought. But all of us have to depend on God to come through our times of suffering. And the way you measure a man or a woman of God is the scars they have on their soul. I don't want to hear somebody preach to me that has never bled before. I don't want to hear somebody preach to me that's had a silver tongue and he was born. He's never gone through a problem and he was given all these things in ministry. No, I want to know somebody that has a personal testimony. I've had some breakthroughs in my life. I know what it's like to suffer. I ain't afraid of suffering because I've learned a secret and I pray that every one of you will get it today. These moments of breakthroughs are times of great self-discovery. You find out I came through it. I can come through this. God brought me through it. What are you doing? You're strengthening your testimony. That's what happened with David. He's out there on the, in the middle of nowhere taking care of his sheep, being an obedient uh, son to his father, and here comes a bear coming into the flock. And the anointing of God comes on him, that worshiper, that prayer washer, prayer uh, warrior. And he goes out with his own hands. He destroys the bear. And then a little later, here comes a lion. And God says, the same way that I anointed you to take out the bear, you got a testimony, you go take the lion out. What happened? It's line upon line, precept upon precept. Don't forget what God has brought you through. Build on those experiences. Wake up. Pay attention to your life. You have a testimony. David was not afraid of the lion because he had an experience with a bear, but that was not the end of it. God was training him. He said, son, if I can teach you how to recognize my anointing and take out the bear and take out the lion, one day you're going to stand before Goliath. He's going to be the champion of the enemies of Israel. And you're going to stand before him, not with any kind of armor on or sword of a shield. You're going to stand against him in the same anointing I gave you on the backside of nowhere. I'm going to give you the anointing and the power. And God took one little stone and a little sling slot from a shepherd. And when David threw that, that stone at Goliath, God directed it and supersonic speed came on the stone and it hit the enemy in the head, knocked him down. David took his big old sword out. The, God destroyed the enemy with his own weapon and David cut his head off and held up that giant head. And he said, let the God of Israel be God today. No one can stand. You've got to get some suffering in you. Don't be afraid to suffer, honey bunny. Don't be afraid to go through some persecution. Somebody stand up and clap your hands right now. I want you to thank God. You're here today. You've made it. you got a story. you got a testimony back there. This is a part of true believers, our lives. Am I helping you right now? There's not a person in this room that is alone today in your suffering. Oh, no, you're not alone. How did, how did they make it through it? When you're suffering, you've got to know the word of the Lord is inside of you. They appreciated the word. They received it as the word of God. We must never treat the Bible as a, just another book. The Bible is different in origin, character, content, and the cost of having it. The Bible is the very word of God. It was inspired by the Spirit of God and written by men of God who were moved on by the Holy Ghost. I had over an hour conversation with my youngest son last night. In my bedroom, he said, tell me again, how did we get the Bible? How, when, how was it written? And I just, we just started going. I said, okay. Oh, I, I opened up to the, the second page of his Bible. It's got all the Old Testament. I said, okay, look at this. We're going to start in the beginning. First five books of Pentateuch. How God took care. That became the law of Israel. And then they started the kings and they were recording. And then came all the prophets. And then Jesus talked about the law, the law and the prophets. Now it brought it over 400 silent years. 
years into the gospel. And now God spoke to a little virgin girl and, and an angel appeared and Mary gave birth to the Messiah. And people started writing down his life because there was nobody like Jesus. You know why? Jesus was the word of God made flesh. This is Jesus. This is the word of God. They, they understood the word of God is pure. It's perfect. The Bible was written at a great cost, not only to the writers, but to Jesus Christ, who became a man that the word of God might be given and presented to us. God, the father of creation, sent his word. The, the way a true believer treats his Bible shows how he values Jesus Christ. If you never read your Bible, you're not learning anything about what God has done for you for your salvation. I don't know how to know God. You need to read the holy word of God. This is God on printed form. Why do you need to read about Abraham? Because you're going to find yourself in the story. It's not just some story passed down. It's written to you with your name on it. We have to be people of the word. Like those Thessalonians, we have to appreciate it. We have, I want to ask you a question. Would you rather have your Bible than food? You believe Job was a blessed man? You believe he came through, through many breaking moments of suffering? And he came out on the other side of it. God said, I'm just going to blow you. I'm going to give you more blessing than you can even handle. I'm going to make you live so long, you're going to see my blessings multiply, multiply, multiply. Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Matthew 4, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The word of God is bread. Hebrew 5, God's word is milk and meat. Psalm 119, 103 the psalmist said, the word of God is sweeter than honey to my soul. Yeah. Sweet. It's not bitter. Sweet. Jesus is a living word. The Bible is his written word. But in essence, they are the same. Both Jesus and his word are bread, our light, our truth. I want to ask you, would you rather have God's word than money? Well, the writer in Psalm 119 made it clear that God's word meant more to him than all the riches and thousands of coins of gold, silver, and even great spoil. Well, I don't have any money. That's not my question today. If you don't ask the right questions, you don't get the right answers. How many of you own a Bible today? You're not too excited about it. Ain't no big deal. Yeah, I got, yeah but I got, I got a computer too. And I got, yeah, I got. Now stop all that. You need to know something. If you don't have a bologna sandwich on your table, if you've got the word of God, you've got something that will nourish your soul. And before long, you'll be eating steak because the word of the Lord is life. The word of the Lord is inside of you right now. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're suffering through, but I want you to know, I'm gonna remind you about a heavenly resource. The word of God is within you now and it's working. Somebody thank God for his word right now. We grow through it. This is how we grow through suffering, the word of the Lord. They appropriated the word. They did not just hear it. They took it into their inner man. They made it a part of them. How do you do that? That you appropriate God's word by meditating on it, thinking on it over and over. It becomes a part of the inner man. Meditation on the word is the spiritual life, is to the spiritual life what digestion is to the physical life. It takes time to digest the word, to meditate, but it's the only way to appropriate God's word and to grow in your suffering. What are you going through today? What are you tempted with? Find a Bible verse and meditate long enough to where you memorize it. And then what do you do? You start confessing out of your mouth. I shall live and not die. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen. Amen. They applied the word. They obeyed the word by faith. And the word went to work in their lives. Now, you got to remember, I'm going back to last Sunday. These were pagans that all of their lives, they had a history of serving many gods, of, of cutting themselves in front of idols and bleeding and trying to give a sacrifice to be forgiven, to try to, to, for God to forgive them. 
They wanted to be forgiven. Jesus came to be the blood sacrifice for them. When Paul told them that, they were, they were thrilled. You mean we don't have to worship these idols and give blood sacrifice? You mean Jesus? Yeah, he shed his blood. Yeah, we, we heard about him. Yeah, that was for us. The majority of them were Gentiles. But we, he was a Jew. The 12 disciples were Jews. We thought it was just for Jews. Paul said, oh, no. He said, it's for the Gentile. In fact, I'm a Jewish rabbi, but God has sent me to the Gentiles. Aren't you glad that God chose the greatest rabbi in first century Judaism to write to all of us non-Jews? Are you feeling better yet? Is it just another Sunday to you? I am your pastor, and I'm stuffing you with meat right now. You ain't going to leave here empty. You open up your ears. How many of you know the word of the Lord works within us during our suffering? It's not enough to just appreciate it or appropriate it. We must apply the word. That's by being obedient doers of the word. Because when we believe God's word and we obey, he releases power. Holy Ghost power that works in our lives to fulfill his purposes. Every man in this room that's a true believer, God's got everything that you need inside of you through the word working in you to be a wonderful husband. It's all inside you. Well, I don't know about it. Start reading the word. Every wife in here, you know, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're reading God's word, you're going to be an excellent wife. I don't need to hear about what your family did when they were worshiping idols. Have you come through that yet? The way you really come through that is to have a moment of breaking where you have so much pain that you, you might have an experience where your family, they don't speak to you for a year. Oh, God, I'm going to die. You are going to die. You're going to die depending on your family to save your soul. And then you're going to walk into spirit and truth, and you're going to see all these different nationalities, and they're going to come loving on you. And one day, has it happened yet? Have you had the breakthrough? One day, it's going to break through to you. These people in here love me more than my goofy aunt or my old daddy. Huh? Oh, that's a phenomena. It's all in the Bible. But you don't get the blessing until you have a breakthrough of understanding. And that breakthrough doesn't come when you're feeling good. I'm sorry. The breakthrough comes and you will experience great healing. The greatest healing in your life will come after breakthroughs. You say, I'm, I'm, I'm well today. I'm, I feel good today. No, I'm not talking about your body. You give yourself time. That'll catch up with you. Okay. But I'm talking about your soul. See, all of us are born broken. All of us are born sick. We're born in sin. Now, the antidote to that is Jesus because Jesus said, I didn't come to the people that are well. I came to the sick people. And if, now, if you just took the, the tip of the iceberg of the word of God, you think, oh, he just came to help people that were, had some, an issue of blood or disease. No, no. He defined what sickness was. Sickness was people that knew they needed God. People that were well would not listen to his words because they, they had a knowledge. They felt like they were smart enough. That's why it doesn't matter where you're at in life. You need to get ready for your next breakthrough because God has more for you. But as you come through it, you're not afraid anymore. He said, okay, God, God, you brought me over that mountain, through that valley. You're going to bring me through this valley. Because there's other parts of your life. What's the goal? The goal is for God to make you like Jesus. He's the ideal, to be like him. So we have this resource of the word of the Lord. It helps us to grow during our suffering. Amen? Amen. Another resource he talked about here was God's people that are around us. Watch this. Catch this. He says in, in verse 14, Dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen, your own people. In this way, in this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea who, because of their belief in Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets and even killed Jesus, and now these Jews are persecuting us too. They, they fail to please God, and they work against all humanity. They, they keep trying to keep us from preaching the gospel that Jesus, a Jew, his salvation brought to the non-Jews, the Gentiles. He said, by doing this, they continue to pile up their sins, but the anger of God has caught up with them at last. 
Now, Paul doesn't hate his own nationality of people, but he understands that the Jews were fighting against the will of God, and he named it. He, he, his practice was wherever he went, he would go to the synagogue first. He went to the Jews first. But he is saying, the Jews were the one that forced me to leave you after only three weeks of being there with you. The Jews are the one that have stirred up. But, but what, what he was telling them, though, you are not alone. The word of God is working in you. You're walking in obedience. And now you recognize the people of God are around you. The church family is there with you. Through the years in ministry, I've often found suffering people can become the most self-centered and think they're the only ones going through the furnace of, t- of suffering. So, you know, and, and that's why it's amazing to me, maybe, maybe 10% of the people, when I do visit them, if they're in the hospital, the majority of them will say, oh, I'm going through this, will you help me? And, and that's what we're there for. We're there to minister. We're not expecting, okay. But then every once in a while, I run across these rare people that have suffered so long, they have had so many breakthroughs, through their suffering, that when I come in, they say, I'm so glad you're here. How's your wife? How's your kids? I'm thinking, time out. This is a hospital call. I am here to help you. And they talk about how good God is. They talk about how much they love the church. They talk about how so-and-so called them or brought them food or sent them flowers. And their report is like, you're, you're here and you, you might have a terminal disease, but you're testifying by your life. What happens? Because they have paid attention to the suffering in their life and they've recognized, you know what? God's word is in me and I've learned through the years. How about some old timers in here? That the saints of God have always prayed for me. Please stay in the church more than two months. Why? So you can learn that there's people that will always pray for you and also for you to learn how to bear somebody else's burden. We have this heavenly blessing of God's people around us. I thank God for the church. I thank thank God for the the people in the, in the, the church that I was raised in 100 years ago back in Southern Illinois, that little church. And I thank God for those precious people that, 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 uh, big Jim Suey that pray. Was he Big Jim? Well, he was like 6'1". He's a big concrete worker. and everybody, He's the biggest guy in the church, so they called him Big Jim. And, and, and you know what? He did not sue anybody because they called him that. He didn't say, oh, you're being... No, no, no. Was, I mean, he's Big Jim. That's just who he was. Well, Big Jim had his arms around me. He prayed the Holy Ghost into me. Sometimes I wonder whether I wanted it or not. I mean, he was praying so... Fr- now, I did want it <laughs> but because but, I prayed so many times. But I, the, the anointing on God, and I, I remember the transfer, the presence of God came on me, and then I forgot about Big Jim and the other people there, and I began to worship God, began to speak in other tongues. It was, just, it was a glorious experience. That happened because the church was around me. I want, now, I'm, the, I'm the pastor, but I have a testimony too. I thank God there's over 40 men in this church that pray for me and my family every day. That's why we are here today. There's people in this church that I have prayed through, but not, not only that, there's only one of me. But through the years, there have been dozens and hundreds of people now that have prayed for me and my wife and my kids and church leaders, what's going on in the church. Prayer changes things. When we have people around us, the church of God is around us. Everyone goes through normal human suffering, like sickness and loss. We all experience that in life. But Paul is referring to the suffering that we endure because of our witness, our testimony. Not only were these saints imitators of the Lord and Paul, they also became imitators of other believers in their suffering through their persecution. The saints in Judea suffered at the hands of the Jews, and the saints in Thessalonia suffered at the hands of the Jews. What, what did that do to them? They're, they're human. They, Paul said, you are suffering just like the people in other churches farther away from here. You don't even know them, but let me tell you how they suffered. And, and, and when, when, when we're told about other people going through we're, what we're going through, what, what happens? We relate. Oh, oh, oh you mean, oh, I mean you, you went through this too? That's why you never waste your sorrows in the kingdom of God. Whatever hell that you've had to pray through, whatever dark hole that, you, that God brought you out of to be here today in the house of the Lord, that dark hole, the devil says, you can never thank God for that. My Bible says give thanks in all things. In everything, give thanks. Okay? So 
Now, 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 let me be your pastor. That means if you came out of some kind of addiction, when you see somebody coming into the church and they're struggling with that, you go and pray for them and say, hey, can I talk to you after church? Let me tell you. I, I just want to tell you. I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to tell you my testimony. Let me tell you where I came from. And they're going to go, you're kidding. You, you mean you went through that? That's the same thing. Man, I had the same kind of, well, well, man, that's awesome. He said, and you say, I understand where you're coming from. I love you. I'm going to be praying for you. Let me have your hand right now. And when you hold their hand, don't hold it like a dead fish, cold fish. You get a hold of their hand. Hold on to make a Holy Ghost connection. And you pray in Jesus' name, God, you brought me through this, and you're going to bring my new brother through this. And I bless him to come through it. We are here for one another. We have the people of God around us. Paul encouraged these suffering Christians by assuring them their experiences were not new or isolated. Others had suffered before them and, and were even suffering now. The churches in Judea were not exterminated by the suffering. If anything, they were purified and they were increased in their number through that suffering. The persecutors were filling up the measure of of wrath to be heaped upon their heads, the Jews. Saints have been saved to the uttermost, but sinners will experience the wrath of God to the uttermost. So Paul said, don't worry about them. Now, and, and Paul did not excuse his lack of caring for those precious people. He was operating in the calling of an apostle, a pastor, a teacher, to establish a church as a missionary. And, and, and he told him, this has happened, but, but don't let this cast you back into worshiping idols. I want to encourage you. He, he, he kept fumbling over himself during this first, uh, the, these four chapters, saying, I wanted to be there. I tried to get to you, but I couldn't get to you. But I want to encourage you. You can grow through your suffering. That's another great value of the local church. We stand together in times of difficulty. We encourage one another. Press on. Grow through this. I'm going to listen to you, I'm going to weep with you, but I'm not going to leave you weeping. I'm going to say, I'm going to be praying for you because you need ministry right now. I'm not going to be afraid to tell you God's going to bring you through this. I'm going to tell you that I'm praying for you. And I'm going to be honest and say, I don't know how, I don't know when. I tell people all the time, it is impossible for you to pray for God to save your loved ones without God acting according to that prayer. He has to act. That's his word. You cannot separate him from his word. He said, you have not because you ask not. You got Prayer is asking. We need to be asking for the moon. We need to be, I'm, I'm praying for tens of thousands of people to be saved, even through this local church before the rapture takes place. How? I don't know how. I'm only human, but my God is more than human. He is the almighty spirit. He has all power. He has all knowledge. He knows the end from the beginning. He's waiting on you and me. Come on, somebody. Come on now. He's, that's right. You're doing it. He's waiting on us to cry out. Cry out. And what do we do? We cry out together. We're going to cry out here in just a few minutes. We're going to pray together. It's a church being together. It was when Elijah isolated himself from the other faithful Israelites that he became discouraged and he wanted to quit. He he got discouraged and the Lord said, I got 70 prophets holed up in a cave. They're still believing in me. I'm saving them. You're not the only one going through this. A lonely saint is very vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. We need each other in the battles of life. Amen. Somebody said yes? Okay. Okay. So don't get isolated. Yeah, but you know what? We just never speak to anybody. Well, it's time for you to open your mouth and start speaking. Start talking. Well, I don't want to be in a life group because... Why? Well, I have to open up and they're going to think I'm weird. We all think you're weird now. We already know you're weird because you're not being real. Where do you get this at? Here? Me telling you the truth? When you have these moments of breaking, it strips every... You, it's like, huh, emotionally, I'm naked here. Guess what? When Jesus died, I hate to break this to you. I don't even want to think about it. They stripped him naked in front of the world. Why? Because he had nothing between him materially and the abuse of the people down there killing him. 
He had no protection. He didn't even have a, 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 a sheet covering his nakedness, stripped. Now, follow me now. Don't misapply that. Sometimes we need to get real with people. More often than not, how are you doing? What do you really want to know? Okay, bam, that's a gospel conversation. Yes, I want to know. I want to know. I was talking to a guy in a business and this week and transacting business. I said, so what's your story? He looked at me like, I'm the professional here. You're the customer. What do you need to ask me? I said, no, what's your story? Tell me about your life. And guess what? You start talking like that, he started telling me the sorrows that he experienced in life. He understood. This is my story. He was downcast. And, 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 and he married a gal that loved God. And he started going to church. And he said, we're looking for a church. And I said, that is why I am here. <laughs> That's why I want to know your story. Why? Because I want to be able to help you. If I can help somebody, I, I, it, it, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much just greeting somebody, smiling, praying with somebody. When, when, when you ask somebody, hey, how's your day? And they say, well, it's not going very good. Okay, I have three minutes right here. I have enough time to touch somebody to try to understand them and to put some hope in them and, and, and quickly point them to Jesus. I'm going to point them to Jesus. I'm going to plant a seed. And I'm going to say, like I said, okay, brother, he says, is he your brother? Is he in the church? Nobody's my brother in Adam. He's my brother. Okay, we all came from Adam and Eve. I said, brother, I'm going to pray for that. That's, your most, he's, that's the most important prayer need I have right now, pastor. I said, can we pray right here? Yeah, right in this business? Yeah. So we, we prayed just a short prayer. I said, I'm going to be praying for you. I saw him a week later. I came back and said, how are you doing? He said, better. I said, I've been praying for you. Now, and I'm not good with names. I said, is your wife, is her name? He said, you remembered. And I'm thinking in my mind, that's a God thing because I can't remember names. <laughs> and I got the name right. It was a good guess. I got the name right. You know, he said, wow, you remember? I said, and I, I sincerely have been praying for him. Why? Because I'm on this. The only reason that you and I legitimately have a reason to live is to help somebody get to heaven. That's why I'm alive, bro. That's why you're alive, sister. And we can't make it on our own. We have this resource from heaven, God's word working in us. Then we have God's people around us. Somebody said yes? yes. Let me give you one more. Psalm 17. We, Paul said, I want to remind you, while you're suffering, you have this heavenly resource that God's glory is before you. That, it's a second definition of before. God's glory is just ahead of you. God's glory is ahead of you. He said, dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you. We, we cared about your soul, your growth. You were suffering. We knew you were suffering. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried over and over, but Satan hindered or prevented us. After all, he says, what gives us hope and joy? He says, this is so great. What, what will be our proud reward and our crown when we stand before the Lord Jesus when he returns? He said, it is you. You. Brothers and sisters, he said, you are our pride and joy. The most valuable thing on this earth in the material, visible world is the souls of men and women around you. It's the soul of that child. Every living being has a soul. Now, this gets, we kind of get into gray areas where some people like, oh, okay, well, they might have a disability, and you think, oh, yeah, but they can't really understand. They, oh, but, but now, wait a minute, though. No, that little whatever label that's been put on them, and, and, and people have real difficulties. I know that, and I, please follow me. That, that, that guy's got a soul in there. That little girl that can't walk, she's got a soul in there. There's a soul in there. I'm going to love the soul of Jesus that he put in there, all right? Why? Because that's going to be the greatest rewards we have in heaven. You think we're going to get decorated because, well, yeah, you were faithful. You, you know, out of 52 Sundays, you were there 49. Well, that's a, that's, of course, that's a spiritual discipline path for us to be in the house of the Lord on Sunday. But no, what, what we're going to be rewarded for is the people that we influenced to be 
to, to turn from the idols of this world and say, Jesus in heaven, if you are in heaven, help me right now. And we all know when any honest sinner, how, whatever they've ever done, when they turn to Jesus in faith, the power of God falls. Something comes over them. Oh, start, start weeping. What is it? That's the grace of God coming to lead you into the next step. And, it, and, the, and the steps don't stop. You just keep growing. And then you experience some suffering. And Paul says, grow some more. Paul was not ashamed to state his affection for these precious believers. He wanted to be there longer to help ground them in the apostolic faith. But the enemy drove him out. His absence was only physical. He was still with them with his heart. He was praying for them. He said, I don't stop praying for you. I don't stop. He said, I'm praying for you every day. So he did what he could. What did he do? Because of apostolic authority, he had men under him. Silas was a partner. He was a dominant partner. But he said to Silas, would you please go back to Thessalonia? We've got to help that baby church. We left them. We baptized them. They were filled with the spirit. But they, they, they've not been discipled. Will you go? He talks to Timothy. He talks to Timothy. And, and, and he said, I want you to go back, son. Go back and check. find out if the church is even there. Find out if you can find anybody. Oh, that was, I just think about the glory that was before them. And when Timothy came back to his utter surprise, he found the glory of God on this church that their children were serving God. Other souls had been saved and baptized. And, the, and when he came back to Paul, he said, Paul, the glory of God is on those new believers. The glory of, the glory of God went before us. The glory of God is, is there on them, and they're doing well. Paul said, that's the best news you could bring me. I don't care if I'm sitting in a, a dank prison cell with water and moisture, and it stinks in here, and just a little bit of light. I'm writing these letters. I'm writing to you. And he, he was so excited to know that the glory of the Lord had been on them, was before them. In times of trouble, in testing, it is important that we take the long view of like, life, like Paul did. Paul lived in the future tense as well as in the present. It's so easy. I want to help you now. Come on, let's make this step today. You can't just live in the present tense. You can't just live in the present tense. We, we, are, we, we, we have these different dimensions of salvation. We are saved when we are born again of the water and of the Spirit. We are saved through faith by the grace of God. And, we, and, we, and then we're in the middle of being saved right now. But uh, none of us have, are in heaven right now. You're, at, you're on Walnut Street right now. You're not, this is not heaven. So, so ultimately, we're, do you understand? We're not saved yet. Now, am I saved today? Absolutely. Well, how do I know that? By my behavior. Because I am walking towards him. Anything, Paul said, let every weight that would so easily hold you down and get you stuck. Well, I haven't felt God in years. You're stuck. You should be the first. You should be screaming at this altar today. Oh, I would never do that. Why don't you do that? Well, the pastor's going to kick me out. No, I'm going to kick you in. No, I want you in. I want some people that are serious here because we got three million people that we need to be impacting in Orange County. And you are true believers. And God saved you to help somebody else. You got the word of God working in you. You got plenty of people around you if you'll open your heart to them. And the glory of God is right in front of us. The glory of God is right here. So we're looking forward to, we're living into the future. Paul's actions were governed by what God would do in the future. That's why he kept writing. If he would have got depressed and not worked through his suffering, he wouldn't have written those letters to encourage the church. He said to the Philippians, he, he said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. You study that passage. He said, you need to rejoice in your salvation. You need to rejoice in the grace of God. You need to rejoice in all of the blessings that you have on this earth. And then, when you inevitably get persecuted, and then, when you have to suffer because of your love for Jesus, rejoice again. Rejoice in your suffering because God counted you worthy to suffer for him. Him. Is it going to cost you something to be saved? Absolutely 100%. People going to make fun of you? Absolutely 100%. But don't think that, oh, this is strange. No. 
true believers grow through their suffering. I believe God's going to give us a seven-acre plot of land to build on or something better. Well, that's in front of me. Have you seen that? Only by faith. But faith is the measurement of things you are hoping for, and faith is the very evidence I can't see it. That's how you know you got faith. I can't see it. Now, isn't that, you're like, hmm, that's pretty deep. Yeah, it is. Because faith is not a part of your logic. Faith is in your spirit. Okay, parents, so how are your kids doing? Parents, can I help you? How are your kids doing? Somebody's looking at me like, Pastor, do not ask today. (laughs) Okay. Mom, Dad, you're going to have to see the glory that's right in front of them. The glory right in front of them. The glory of God is the power of God, the blessing of God. Paul knew that Jesus would return and reward him for his faithful ministry. And on that day, the saints from Thessalonia would bring glory to God and joy to his heart. So I want to tell all of the true believers here today, you will grow through your suffering because God's glory is before you. Hear me, the best is yet to come. I need some believers to stand up right now. Arise, church of the living God. I want you to throw your head back, clap your hands, and thank God that the best is yet to come. Ah, the best is yet to come. God knows what's best for me. We're going to grow through the suffering. God's glory is in front of us. That means miracle breakthroughs are just ahead of us. Don't be afraid. His powerful manifestations, miraculous healing, signs and wonders are right in front of us. And the same way that the Thessalonians received that word, I want us to receive that word as we prepare to pray right now. See, when the Christians at Thessalonica read this letter, it encouraged them tremendously. They said, oh, we're not strange. We're not different than the other churches. They were going through intense persecution and suffering. Some of them were tempted to give up, but those, those young disciples, something was in them, and, and, and they were trying to help one another. I'm sure many of them were barely holding on until the letter arrived. They didn't know then this letter was going to be canonized. This was the holy word of God that the apostle Paul wrote to them, and they wrote it, and it was like, I get it. Okay, we can do this. Paul was saying, don't give up. He encouraged them, hold on to the spiritual resources you have in Jesus. He reminded them, you have the word of God within you. He reminded them, you have the people of God around you. You have the glory of God right before you. This is no time to give up. He said, let's grow. Let's grow together. And I'm saying to you, church, today, this is not a time for us to give up. It's a time for us to grow. And we're going to go through the breaking points. Somebody said amen. Amen. Who wants to be first right now to have a breakthrough? Would you come right now? I want to draw you in right now. What are you suffering with today? You say, Pastor, this is a new one. I know it is because God's got a new breakthrough for you. This is a part of it. You're not, you're not, going, you're not weird. You're not strange. You're not some. I'm, you're, you're not, oh, I'm a horrible person. No, you're going through a hard time right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you're not going through a hard time right now, I invite you to come right now so that God can strengthen you to be able to increase the size of your box, ministry box, to where you can help more people right now. Hallelujah. You can do that today. We can have breakthroughs here today. You don't have to give up today because that breakthrough is going to give you a new awareness of how God is helping you right now, and he's going to work through you. In Jesus' name, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I want, I, want us to, I want us to give it to the Lord right now before we pray for one another. I want us right now, if you're suffering, if you're being persecuted for Jesus, would you close your eyes, everybody? Today's a moment. At this, at this moment, under the anointing of this present word upon us, this moment of breaking into a bigger dimension of the glory of God is here today. We're going to break through it today. Would you lift your hands right now and surrender? I'm going to pray over you. And then when I pray, I want you to begin to worship God right now. In your mind, I want you to release. Tell God what you're going through. Now, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this holy word today. I thank you for the word of God. 
Lord, which is a spirit of God inside of every one of these true believers, Lord. I know that your word is working. I pray right now, Lord, that you would bring a verse to the mind of each individual believer here today. A word, a scripture they can reach out and hold on to right now, Lord, to claim that word, how you're going to help them right now, God. I pray, Lord, even though they are in pain, that right now, God, you would move them through the pain, God, and break through. I pray that there would be a release, God, into a new dimension to give us more wisdom, to give us more anointing, to give us more faith, God. Help us to have a transformation to become more like you to do during this breakthrough. I pray that you would bring it to pass right now, Lord, so that we can be more like you, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Would you praise him right now with me? Hallelujah! I give you the praise, Lord. I give you the glory, Lord. Hallelujah. I praise you for it right now, God. You said that you Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With your eyes closed, just receive that right now. That is all that matters. Hallelujah. That pain is bringing you through. Hallelujah. You're breaking through. Lord, break them through the sickness, the disease. In Jesus' name. Break them through the trauma. And you are a God. Lord, break them through. My brother, through the memory of that sin. Break through.